Hello, this is Arnon, and this is going to be a talk about um, how to implement and design a really fast and scalable server using Python. So the first question is obviously going to be why Python, because Python is slow, as everybody knows. So why not use uh, Java or, uh, or Go or, uh, or Node.js or anything like that? Um, so yes, Python can be really slow um, in certain uh, use cases, and if you know to avoid these use cases, then actually Python could be really, really fast. Um, so for example, uh, instantiating your own Python classes uh, with hundreds and thousands of objects could be really, really slow. Uh, but as long as you stick to built-in data structures, it can actually be surprisingly fast, surprisingly fast. So, for example, dictionaries uh, are implemented with a hash map, and because Python uses dictionaries all over the place, it has a very uh, highly optimized implementation of the hash map. It is, is actually comparable to other C and C++ implementations of, of hash maps. So learn to love dictionaries, use them wherever, uh, all over the place. Uh, they're really, really, really fast. Um, generally, you want to avoid uh, for loops and recursion. So you, uh, when implementing a, a server that uses a database, um, you want to use the database to its fullest um, and use a cache server. Um, you want to avoid doing for loops and doing queries within for loops as much as possible and avoid the recursion. You specifically want to avoid the recursion with two queries. And you do all that by just optimizing your queries, uh, doing relational uh, database um, kind of things. Uh, recursive queries can also happen, recursion can also happen without actually writing a recursion. Uh, there could be uh, a stream of functions that the last one calls the first one at some point, and the whole process being stopped at a certain you know, sample value or whatever. Um, so you want to really be careful about that. Uh, doing for loops and searches in Python can be comparatively really, really slow compared to to optimizing the query and do it all in the database. The database is very optimized for doing these kinds of searches. Um, you should use a cache server. Uh, it will also uh, be apparent why later. Um, and you should store dictionaries in it or lists of dictionaries. And you should use it to also help you pre filter queries. So Instead of running for loops, you can um, have in, in the cache server a cache dictionary which with values that uh, you want to use in the query for uh, for filtering it. Um, you should use a database abstraction layer. Um, what I mean by database abstraction layer is not your uh, usual uh, active record pattern kind of uh, um, uh, ORM, uh, object relation mapper. Um, these things uh, generally are not very well suited for optimizing queries. So database abstraction layers allows you to still optimize queries using Python uh, objects 
that are then generating the SQL for your specific database that you're actually using. Uh, active record pattern can make it very, very difficult and you can generate really unoptimized queries. Um, so don't use it. Um, the result sets should be uh, basically lists of dictionaries. Um, even a database abstraction layer can have a convenience layer which basically wraps around the result set that is given uh, from the database, from the database uh, uh, driver. Um, it basically um, instantiates some Python class uh, for each record and each record set. And as we saw, as I said, the uh, Python class instantiation can be really, really slow. So if you can scratch that uh, convenience layer and just use the raw uh, uh, list in the, uh, dictionaries and list of dictionaries that the database driver is giving you, especially if the database driver is also a C extension in itself, it can have the huge impact. Um, in uh, synthetic tests that I did profiling, we we got something in the order of two orders of magnitude, so around 100 times faster. Um, in real world cases, we got around 20 times faster. So this could be huge um, in terms of uh, performance. So again, use the extensions. I uh, can't stress that enough. Uh, do as much of the computation as possible with the C compiled um, extension to Python and not in pure Python. Uh, we'll see it come over and over again in this presentation. Um, so Python is slow. Just use built-ins as much as possible, not complex data structures, and use the extensions as much as possible. Um, okay, that was uh, performance. Before we continue with it, uh, let's talk about uh, the architecture, and a bit about uh, scalability, and how that um, come together. So the typical server architecture has a bunch of clients. They talk to a server. Uh, they usually don't talk directly to an application server. They, uh, there are multiple application servers running behind a load balancer. And the application servers talk to a database and to a cache server. Um, I, I deliberately um, left out the implementation details of what it means to be an application server. Is it a process? Is it a thread? It's some kind of execution context. It could be a thread, it could be a, a something else, it could be a process, or it could be a different machine. It doesn't really matter. Uh, scalability means that you can use any combination of these uh, things, and load balancer doesn't care. And the clients don't care. Um, but when you do that, you come to a problem with shared mutable states, so, which is evil, as everybody knows. Um, so, shared mutable state is evil, but guess what? The database is a store of shared mutable state, and everybody uses databases. So. Uh, relational database management systems, RDBS, uh, some of them have solved that problem using what's called a version, a multi version concurrency control, MVCC, which basically means that each uh, execution context, let's say a request to the, uh, in the application server, has its own view uh, of the data in the database. So if anyone else 
changes something in the database while the request in the application server is in flight, it will not change how that request views the, the, the data, the data that it, it sees. So um, we can use something like that with the cache server. And if we do, if we design our architecture in such a way that each request to the server is completely stateless, there's no, nothing, uh, no state uh, in memory in the process that is being shared and reused um, cross request. The only state uh, uh, that's in memory that's not in the database that is shared between the execution context between requests is in the cache server. Then uh, we can do uh, something similar if each request can pull the entire cache from the cache server, all of it, uh, upon its initialization. Um, so say we, we construct a single dictionary that holds all of the cache, everything, on every request. We pull everything and we have that request will then uh, have to have its own view of the cache, like a snapshot in time with what it had when the uh, request uh, was spawned, the execution, execution context of the request was spawned. Um, thereafter, every change to the database. Uh, Will invalidate, uh, may invalidate, invalidate some of the of the cache queues, relevant cache queues in the cache server, and the updates to the cache server should be done uh, all at once in an atomic operation, an atomic transaction, using a single lock. Basically, means that if an execution context um, for a request, say, um, does some change to the database and validates some of the cache keys and needs to update the data for the, these cache keys in the cache server. It first uh, acquires a lock and then does the changes, the updates to the cache server, um, and then uh, there is the lock. Um, while the lock is in place, no other execution context can access the cache server. It has to wait uh, for the updates to complete. Usually these are really, really small changes and really, really fast because the cache server is fast. And the communication with it should be fast. Um, so it shouldn't have, shouldn't be an issue. Um, and on that note, we, we're using uh, Redis for the cache server, which is a new memory store, uh, no, no SQL uh, memory store, uh, a simple uh, key value uh, store. It has other features, we're not using it, using them. Uh, and it has a C extension to accelerate the communication between the Python process and the Redis server. As I said, use the extensions wherever possible. Um, if we're pulling all of the all of the cache in each request, uh, this means that it has to be really really fast for the request to be responsive. So you shouldn't store too much in the cache server, but that's a generally recommended. Uh, it's generally recommended anyway. Um, but the, the pools need to be really, really fast. Um, so shared mutable state is evil, but if you're using a cache server in, a, in an MVCC style, uh, each request has its own view. You shouldn't have any problem, but um, it needs to be fast. So cache server uh, stores data in a serialized um, format. And we have the problem that serialization, deserialization is expensive, it 
takes processing, it takes time. Um, there are many serialization solutions. Are, uh, not all are created equal. Um, this is not a benchmark that I did, but um, from what I saw, different solutions we have differently for different payloads. Um, so, say we take, for example, three solutions. Um, I actually did uh, profiling for about six or seven of them, but these are the leading, leading three that I chose to focus on. So the first is called Message Pack. It's a binary format. Um, it's a C library which has binding for many languages. The second one called Simple JSON. Again, a C li uh, library with binding to, to different languages. It basically, does JSON serialization, deserialization, and C pickle, which uh, um, which uses the pickle. Um, Format for Python only. Um, so for any payload that do not have, do not include daytime objects that need to be serialized and deserialized, message back is by far the fastest. And after that, simple JSON, and after that, CPICO. Um, but for anything that does have daytime, uh, actually CPICL uh, is the fastest. After that, simple JSON and message back is actually slower than simple JSON for that for some reason. Um, two solutions that are C extensions. All of, the, of these three are actually C extensions or have C optimizations. So, so for example, simple JSON when you install the package. You, you're given an option if you want to compile the C uh, portion of it or use a pre Python uh, implementation. Um, CPICO is built in, uh, it, it comes with Python as far as I'm aware. Uh, there's also a PICO uh, package in Python, it comes with Python, which is an implementation of Python. It's slower, you shouldn't use it. Uh, there's also a JSON, not a simple JSON, just JSON package that comes with Python. It's an, also a, a pure Python implementation. It supports, it maybe supports better uh, uh, complex uh, JSON stuff, but basically simple JSON does the work. Um, so don't use JSON. Um, because it's in Python. Um, okay, so you should design a cache catalog. Um, and you should design it in a, in a module that is important once per execution context, um, whatever it may be, um, upon its uh, instantiate, uh, upon its spawning. So it, when a request is, uh, is received and execution contact is spawned. Uh, the cache catalog should already uh, be uh, in memory. Uh, sorry, it should be imported once per process. Um, we'll see. We'll see in a bit how this works. But basically, the catalog should include serialization formats, related tables, and callbacks. So. Uh, this is how you can mix and match and say, okay, all the all the cache keys that I have that do not have daytime, I can use say message back, and all the ones to do will use CPICL. So this information is stored in the cache catalog, uh, along with which which of the related tables relating to to each uh, each key. And the callbacks that are used to uh, uh, to update the cache key. Uh, you should store only built-in types, uh, list dictionaries, integers, float, and strings. Uh, don't try to use uh, uh, to cache complex Python instances. Uh, for one, is because yeah, I have to use CPICL. Um, and you can't use message back for that. And secondly, 
seems to be really, really slow. And thirdly, it, uh, it won't be cross language. In this case, it doesn't matter, but in some cases it does. Um, message back is cross uh, language. It's a C, um, C library that has bindings for many languages. Uh, JSON is basically every language has its own best thing. Um, okay, so serialization is expensive, but we can mix and match solutions with C extensions uh, to get the, to minimize to minimize the the, the penalty of deserialization on each uh, request. Um, next topic is not specific to Python, it's general to, to servers. So there's a, server, a lot of servers can be I.O. bound. What this means is that most of the time they're spending waiting for I.O. for input output, it could be for file, for socket, for database, for the cache server, or whatever. Something outside the process. Um, and we want to uh, want to use as much as possible from the process without blocking it, preventing it from doing other things. We want to let the, the process do other things while it's waiting for I.O. So the way we do this, uh, there's uh, features in operating systems that allow for a process to have execution context that is halted and being released to, to other execution contexts within the same process. And uh, when it's doing I.O. and the operating system is responsible for notifying that execution context, basically waking it up. Um, once the, the I.O. operation is complete, uh, with, with the data uh, that, that is the result, if there is some result. Um, an application server, um, so it, it should not block on I.O. So if it does I.O., it access the database, access the S server, whatever. Uh, it should be able to do other things while it's waiting for, for the response. It's usually implemented with an event loop, as we'll see in a bit. Um, but using some non-blocking I.O. solution, uh, using the features of the operating system, you can also, you can actually handle thousands of requests, uh, even per second, uh, or basically in flight. Um, with no no problems at all, um, in a very responsive uh, fashion. So servers are I/O bound. That's a problem. We're using a non-blocking I/O solution uh, to solve that problem. So, what should we use for execution context? So the obvious. Um, choice implementation are threads, but threads can be expensive, uh, especially when there's a lot of them. So threads in curl latency, you have to set them up, the, the system thread uh, setup is uh, in curl latency, it takes time and the teardown as well. Um, this is a comparison between multi-threaded uh, uh, web servers and uh, a solution called uh, no, uh, server called Node.js, which basically uses a single thread event loop that is non blocking, which uses callbacks for the execution contexts, as we'll see. Um, and it can do thousands of concurrent requests in flight um, uh, with no apparent effect to response time. Um, threads can also take up a lot of memory. Again, Node.js uh, can have thousands of threads that use very, very little memory. They're very lightweight because they're just callbacks. Um, um, so very minimal execution context. 
sometimes called green threads, very lightweight thread-like execution contexts, uh, usually implemented in a single threaded event loop. So a single thread has an event loop and and uh, it registers um, callbacks whenever it does I/O, and the uh, and the execution context goes to sleep and the process is idle, and then it does other things when another request is coming while it's waiting for uh, the I/O operation to complete. And then it is called back once the the operation is complete with the data. Uh, but we're not talking about JavaScript here, so this is Python talk. So Python has a solution called GEvent. It's a C extension. It instruments the Python stack to utilize the features of the operating system for non-blocking I/O. It has an event loop. It actually used to, at some point, uh, uh, use the same C library that Node.js uses for doing non uh, non-blocking uh, event loop. Um, you can also monkey patch I, uh, uh, any I/O related code in the standard library. So this way you can actually use the standard library as is. Um, um, and uh, behind the scenes or, or under the hood, it is it was monkey monkey patched by GEvent. Uh, to actually operate in a non-blocking I/O fashion, so you can use threads that are, won't be actually th threads uh, under the hood, but would behave like threads. And you can use sockets, and you just write it uh, regularly, as we'll see. Uh, it uses coroutines instead of callbacks, so this is what enables that. Uh, so Node.js uses callbacks because uh, JavaScript is a uh, more limited uh, language. It doesn't have uh, generators. Python has generators. Generators are, uh, are used in this context because it is a way, it's a feature in the language that enables an execution context to be halted and then resumed later. And this feature is being utilized in GEvent uh, at the at the Python stack uh, instrumentation um, portion. Uh, JavaScript is going to have generators uh, in ECMAScript 6, but not yet. But it's not a JavaScript talk. Um, so this allows you basically to to write synchronous looking code. And to use uh, uh, synchronous code, and and have that all run asynchronously under the hood. So each execution context is going to run sequentially. Uh, so it's not uh, async within an execution context uh, scope, but um, it can interleave multiple execution contexts in a non-blocking I/O kind of fashion uh, using a single thread, a single process. Um, uh, use writing completely synchronous-looking code, so no callbacks, none of the uh, problems that call that have with, that happen with callbacks. Uh, so, say so thread is expensive, threads are expensive, so don't use them. I use green threads uh, instead uh, using GEvent. Uh, the last thing, um, say, so, okay, we can't use threads for the execution context, but sometimes you, you need to do something that is computationally expensive, and what if you can't, you don't have a C extension, you don't write one, uh, and still want to use uh, all of the CPU cores that the machine has, so should we use threads for that? Um, the problem is that Python cannot actually be parallelized. Uh, it has something called a global interpreter lock, which basically means that even if you're using multiple threads in Python, you're not actually running uh, them um, 
uh, in a parallel fashion. You can do concurrency, but not parallelism. It will actually um, interleave, uh, do a, a cooperative multitasking. Um, it can interleave with other threads in the system, so you can better utilize uh, um, multiple cores within the context of a single process, but it's not like it's going to do multiple things simultaneously. Uh, it's going to um, jump around between threads and only do one thing at a time. So if you want to get true parallelism, you have to use multiple processes, not threads. Um, and you can combine multiple uh, processes of Python and that each runs the event uh, with its own um, non-blocking our event loop. And then you get the best of both uh, to utilize all the cores in your machine. So you can handle multiple requests uh, simultaneously using different processes. And each one is going to be very responsive because it will be single threaded. And um, this is how multiple things can happen simultaneously in a single machine using multiple Python processes. Um, so Python is not parallelizable. You have to use multiple Python processes. and you should be able to if you're using a single cache server anyway because uh, all the requests are, are stateless and the only shared uh, in memory uh, state is in the cache server so it doesn't matter how many um, execution contexts you have and whether or not they're in um, green threads or real threads or, or multiple processes, um, but for best performance, you, you can use both, use green threads, or with a single process uh, in each, a single thread in each process, use multiple processes to utilize all the cores in your machine. And if you put multiple machines like that behind a, a single load balancer, uh, which all talk to the same single cache server, which can also be load balanced by itself, but that's beyond the scope of this presentation. Uh, so you can have very, very scalable uh, Python-based server. And if you do all the other things i talked about, it could also be really, really fast. So... These are the problems and these are the solutions and uh, thank you very much.